Hello everyone, today we are solving the count semi-primes exercise from the Codility lesson 11. And in this exercise, we have to count the number of semi-primes between two boundaries that are provided by the problem. In order to solve semi-primes problems, we have to have access to prime integers. And this is where we are going to use the sieve of Eratosthenes. And then we will use those prime numbers to compute semi-primes. So a prime number is a positive integer that has exactly two distinct divisors, one and itself. Just to give you an example, we have numbers 2, 3, 5, 7, 11, 13, and 17. These are prime numbers. And a semi-prime number is the product of two prime numbers. As an example, we can take the number 4, which is the product of 2 times 2. So 2 is a prime number. And this product is giving number 4, which is considered a semi-prime number. Number 6, similarly, is equal to 2 times 3, so these two numbers are prime numbers, and their product is considered a semi-prime number. So in this problem, we are given two arrays, P, K, and Q, K, and these represent the boundaries within which we are going to look for semi-prime numbers. For example, let's take the first couple of numbers, 1 and 26, and these are the first semi-prime numbers from 1 up to 26, so we have 4, 6, 9, and so on. And between 1 and 26, we have 10 different semi-prime numbers. And we will keep this number in memory for the moment. Then for the second couple of boundaries, number 4 and number 10, between these two numbers, we have in total 1, 2, 3, and 4. So we have four different semi-prime numbers. And this is a number that we will also push into our results vector. Then the third couple of boundaries, number 16 and number 20, if we look to uh, the list of a number of semi-primes here, we notice that there is none between 16 and 20, and we will push the number zero into our results vector so far. So my solution function should return a vector containing the number of semi-primes contained between each couple of given boundaries. The easiest way and the most efficient way to search for prime numbers is by using the sieve of Eratosthenes. Imagine we would like to detect the prime numbers between 1 and 20. So we're going to consider that all these numbers for the moment are prime numbers, except the number 1, because we already know that this is not a prime number. Then we move on to number 2, that is considered a prime number so far. And we're going to multiply 2 by itself. So 2 times 2 is equal to 4. And since 4 is the product, it's not a prime number. So this one is discarded from our prime numbers list. Then we multiply 2 by 3. And we obtain 6. And so also the number 6 is discarded from the prime numbers. Then 2 by 4 is equal to 8. We discard 8. Then 2 by 5 is equal to uh, 10. And so on until we have discarded all the multiples of the number 2 within the range of our interest. Then we move on to the next non-discarded number, which is number 3, and we multiply 3 by itself. It's equal to 9, so we discard number 9 because it's not a prime number anymore. We know this already. And then 3 is multiplied by 4, so we are discarding 12, but it's already discarded, so we don't have to do it again. Then 3 times 5, we discard 15. And 3 times 6, we discard 18, it's already discarded. 3 times 7 is 21, it's out of our range of interest, so we can stop our testing operation. And we keep testing using this method until we have discarded all the possible elements that are non-prime numbers. And at the end, what we are left with are only the prime numbers, meaning the numbers that cannot be divided except by 1 and themselves. To make this more efficient, we don't have to test, in fact, all the possible numbers. We can limit our search within the square root of our highest number, greatest number in our range of interest. Meaning square root of 20 here is equal to 4.5. We can limit our test between 0 and 5. Because all the other operations are redundant, they were already tested within these elements. The way we are going to write this into a code is by defining a list or a vector or any type of array, depending on the language you are using, of the same size of the elements that we would like to test. And we're going to include the number 0 in this operation. So we're starting with the number 0, then 1, 2, 3, and so on, up to 20. 
and we're going to um, use some kind of coding, I mean, in the new array, in the sense that a number zero would indicate that this particular number is not a prime number, but if there is a number one, it means that this number here, meaning the number two, is a prime number. And we're going to start by an array that is full of one. These are the initial values of the array, except for the first two uh, numbers, because we know number zero and number one are not prime numbers. And then every time we are discarding one number from our prime numbers list, we're going to change its corresponding value in this particular array to zero. If I were to write this in C++, for example, we would start by defining this primes vector of size n plus one, because we are taking into account the uh, first element, which is number zero. And we initialize all the elements of this vector uh, to one with the value one. And then I'm resetting the first two elements, meaning primes zero and primes one to zero. These are not prime numbers. And then I start a for loop starting from i equal to two up to i less or equal than square root of n. I'm incrementing i by one. And inside of this, for each element, we're going to do the uh, described operation in the algorithm. So if this number is still considered a prime number, meaning if its value in the primes vector is still equal to one, I'm going to test starting from k equal to uh, squared i. And while k is less or equal than n, which is the maximum or the highest number of interest, we're going to modify the uh, primes k value to zero, meaning this particular number is not a prime number anymore because we have found factors or divisors for this particular uh, element. And then I'm going to jump with a step that is equal to i, so k plus equal to i. This is equivalent to uh, putting something is equal to uh, twice i, then three times i, then four times i, and so on. Every time we're going to jump with a step that is equal to i instead of using a multiplication operation here. So this is the simplest and most efficient and concise way of writing the uh, sieve of Eratosthenes. We're going to keep this part of the code that we are going to use in our solution at the end. So back to our problem, the solution will be um, thought as follows. First, we're going to check for the prime numbers, but then we have to check for all the semi primes up to our greatest number of interest. So for this, just as we have done for the primes numbers, we have defined a vector or an array in which we have some kind of coding like number one for primes, number zero for non-prime numbers. We are going to define another vector or another array that is called semi-primes. Similarly here, we have number one for semi-prime numbers and number zero for non-semi-prime numbers. We're going to put a loop that is going to test for all the semi-prime numbers and we are scoring these in memory to be used later on. At this point, we can use these arrays in two different ways. Every time we have a couple of boundaries to be tested, we can read through all the semi-primes elements between these two boundaries and check how many of these semi-primes we have because we already have those uh, number one values for semi-prime numbers, and they are saved in our semi-primes vector or array. But this would mean that for each couple of boundaries, we have to read the whole range between the boundaries. So from element number one to element number 26 and do the counting operation. And then from element four of index four up to element of index 10, do the counting operation and so on. So for every couple of boundaries, we are reading the array again, probably not the whole array, but enough of the array to render our algorithm sometimes inefficient. A different way of doing this is by defining another vector or another array where we're calling this the semi primes cumulative value. So it contains the sum of semi primes up to a certain position. So we're going to read this semi primes vector or array and then we are going to do a sum and we are storing these sums into this particular array this way when we have 
a boundary, a couple of boundaries, we can simply do the subtraction, like the number of semi-primes at the position 26 minus the number of semi-primes that we have reached up to a position number one. And this way we have only what is left between those two without really reading throughout all the elements of the uh, semi-primes array. Using the cumulative uh, method is not a new thing we have done here. We have used this in previous lessons. So if you find this idea completely new and cumbersome for you, probably you have to go back to previous lessons and practice where we have used it since it will make your understanding here much easier. So I think that's it for the algorithm. Now let's see how to write this in C++ and in Python. So this is our solution function. It takes the number n, which is the greatest element, uh, limiting our range of search. And then we have the vectors p and q for the boundaries, the given boundaries by the problem. And we are going to start by defining the primes vector with the size n plus 1, all filled with 1, considering all elements for the moment as prime numbers. Then primes 0 and 1, these two elements, we know they are not prime numbers, so we are setting their values to 0. And then we can start our for loop that we have described in the algorithm section. So for i starting at 2 up to square root of n, we're going to check if it's a prime number so far, meaning the prime's i number. And we are checking the results of multiplying this number by other numbers starting from the square of i up to the number n. So the square of i will be discarded as a prime number. We are changing its value to a primes k equal to zero. Then we are jumping a certain distance of i. Remember that n is provided by the problem, by the uh, description of the problem. So it's always something uh, that is taken as a parameter. It's an input parameter for our solution function. So now that we have all our prime numbers in our primes vector, we're going to define the semi-primes vector, and I'm calling it all semi-primes here, same distance, n plus 1. All of these numbers are equal to 0, meaning none of these is a semi-prime for the moment. And then we are going to multiply all the prime numbers, i and j, i going from 0 up to n, j going also up to n, we're going to multiply if i is a prime number and j is also a prime number. So the product of both primes i and primes j is equal to 1. And at the same time, i times j is less or equal than n. There is no need of going further. In this case, we are storing all semi-primes i times j, the product of these, as a semi-prime number. So i times j here is a semi-prime because i is prime, j is prime, so the product of these two prime numbers is a semi-prime number. And the vector all semi-primes with the index i times j is going to be equal to 1. And again, there is no need to go beyond the greatest boundary number of our problem. So if i times j is greater than n, we can break out of this loop and go to the next prime number of i. Then I will define the uh, semi-primes cumulative value, and this will be um, containing the sum of the numbers of semi-primes that we have reached so far at a certain position. And then we are defining an integer, which is the sum, which is equal to zero. And for i going from zero up to uh, n, we are incrementing i, and I'm adding the sum, I'm incrementing the sum of all semi-primes of i. So remember that all semi-primes is a vector that I have just filled with indexes 1 every time I have a semi-prime number. I will add these indexes to a sum value and I will store this value at each position in the semi-primes cumulative i that is equal to s. Again, I'm not explaining this in details because we have already used this technique before in previous videos for previous lessons. If you are here at the lesson 11, it's most probably the case that you have also seen it before for previous solutions. And now we can simply proceed using the following technique for i going from zero up to p dot size, meaning for each couple of boundaries provided by the problem, we are going to check the difference between the semi-primes cumulative at position qi minus the semi-primes cumulative at position pi minus one. The minus one was added to take an edge case into account here. So the total number of semi-prime numbers 
between QI and PI is equal to the difference of these two cumulative values. And then I'm storing the result in the semi primes I. It's a new vector that I have also defined here, which size is equal to the size of P, meaning also the size of Q. At the end, we are going to return semi primes. This solution provides you a 100% score. And I have kept these pieces of code that are brute forcing just to show you the difference. I mean, if you don't want to use the cumulative, you can brute force things using this part here. But then again, you wouldn't probably score 100%. It's going to be a less efficient solution. In Python, it's almost the same solution. We have n, p, and q. n is a number, which is the greatest number or the boundary of our problem. Then we have p and q, two lists. So we are starting by defining a primes list set to one as initial values of size n plus one. Then we have the primes zero element and the primes one are equal to zero, meaning these first two elements are not considered as prime elements. Then for i in range 2 up to square root of n plus 1, so we're adding 1 to, to cover one extra element in case we have an edge case problems here. If we have a prime number at position i, we're going to check k equal i times i at first. And while k is less or equal to n, every element k is not considered a prime anymore because it's the product of two factors. And we are going to jump k plus equal to i, meaning it's going to be i times i at first, but then it's going to be i times i plus i, i times i plus two i's, i times three i's, and so on. It's the same as doing the uh, product of uh, the elements as we have described in the algorithm section. So then we have all the semi primes list that is of size n plus one and initialized at zero at first because we don't have any semi primes at this moment. Then for i in range zero up to n plus one and for j in range zero up to n plus one, I'm checking if i and j are both prime numbers and if their product is less or equal than n, meaning I'm still within the boundaries of my problem, I can conclude with a semi prime number, which is the product of i times j. And in this case, in the list of all semi primes, the index i times j is going to be changed to 1 because at this particular position for this particular element, I have a semi prime number. And an edge case test is that if i times j exceeding the number n, I'm going to break out of this loop and continue uh, incrementing the um, variable i. Then we define the semi primes, the list where I'm going to put my results. And we will need the semi primes cumulative also. So it's initialized at zero with size n plus one. And we have the sum that we are going to use to fill the semi primes cumulative. So at this point, it's equal to zero. Then for i in range from zero up to n plus one, I'm going to add to the sum s the uh, number of all semi primes that we have reached so far at position i. And I'm going to insert this sum into the semi primes cumulative at this position i. Once this is done, I can simply and at any position i proceed by doing the difference between the um, uh, two cumulative values at position qi and at position pi minus one for an edge case, just to include the element pi in our calculation. And I'm going to put this difference into the semi primes i element. And when all of this is done, I can return the semi primes vector or list, which is the result of this function. I know the solution might seem a bit too long for you, but these techniques we have used before. I mean, we know why we are limiting our calculation to a square root of a number already. If you haven't seen this, I think it's in lesson nine or 10, we have used this, uh, uh, this limit. And we also have used the cumulative method in previous lessons to accelerate uh, our algorithm and to make it more efficient. Now, there are different ways of brute forcing parts of this algorithm. 
that we have described and the C++. If you are interested in those, you can go back and check the uh, C++ solution. This is it for this exercise. I'm going to leave you checking the uh, video, the solutions, and maybe um, enhancing your practice experience. I hope you are finding these exercises helpful for your preparations. If so, please take a moment to support this channel by liking this video and maybe subscribing to the channel. Until our next lesson or our next exercise, keep up the good work and see you next time.